I'm going to talk about p partitions in permutation enumeration. And this talk is pretty much expository. There's not, for any of those who were experts on p partitions, there's probably not a whole lot new in it, but probably most of you aren't really experts on p partitions. So this is, um, well, I'm going to talk about some applications, some of which are <coughs> well known and some not so well known. Uh, the theory of p partitions, which was developed by Richard Stanley in his PhD thesis in 1972. Uh, so one way to think of this is a partition of an integer is just a way of writing that integer as the sum of positive integers, where the order doesn't make any difference. But it's convenient to write the parts traditionally in weakly decreasing order. But for my purposes, I'm going to write them in increasing order. So, uh, so a partition of an integer k is a sequence or a function. I'm going to call it a function uh, of, from the set of integers from 1 up to n. So I have n parts to the positive integers such that the parts are in weakly increasing order. The, the, the values of f are in weakly increasing order. And the sum of the values of f is k. Now, for what I'm going to do, I'm actually not even, I don't even really care what the sum is. I'm not going to be concerned with that. But the question is, what happens if we replace these inequalities, f1 less than or equal to f2 up to f of n, we replace them with some more general inequalities. Now, of course, you could have all kinds of inequalities. But I'm going to just look at a very special kind where things work out nicely where the inequalities are just saying that f of i is less than or equal to f of j, or f of i is less than f of j. So we're going to be looking at, at a very simple kind of inequalities. And uh, it turns out that studying these inequalities is very closely connected with some aspects of permutation enumeration, in particular the descents of permutations. So let's look at a very simple set of inequalities. This, this is my favorite example. You have a function f defined on the set 1, 2, 3. And you have just two inequalities. f of 2 is less than f of 1. And f of 2 is less than or equal to f of 3. So we want to look at the set of solutions of these two inequalities. And you notice that there's no restriction between f of 1 and f of 3. So one thing that we could do is we could split up the set of solutions into two parts by saying, OK, there are two cases. Either f of 1 is less than or equal to f of 3, or f of 3 is less than f of 1. Now, you might ask, why did I put the less than or equal to there rather than in the other position? And I'll, I'll talk about that later. But if we do that, then things work out very nicely, and we find that the set of solutions of my original set of inequalities breaks up into a disjoint union of these two systems of inequalities. And these are really nice. So at least for the, per the, the things that I'm going to want to do with these inequalities, if I have a system of inequalities that looks like this, then that's, you know, we, we know as much as we want about that kind of system. So the, sort of the basic idea is we've got some system of inequalities and we'd like to break up the set of solutions as a disjoint union of systems of inequalities that look something like this. And in fact, you might say, well, why do we want to do that? And the real reason is because we want to count permutations. Or at least that's why I want to do it. But you might want to do it for some other reason, too. I mean, that's about as simple as you can get. So this is the basic idea, as I see it, of the theory of p partitions. We want to take some system of inequalities and express it as a disjoint union like that. So one thing that you might be wondering, why did I break it up into f of 1 less than or equal to f of 3 and f of 1 greater than f of 3? What if I put the less than or equal in the other part, made it f of 1 less than f of 3 and f of 1 greater than or equal to f of 3? Well, that wouldn't have worked very well. And the reason is that if you did that, you break the system up into two pieces, but one of them would be f of 2 less than f of 1, less than f of 3, which is fine. But the other one would have these conditions. It would be f of 2 less than or equal to f of 3, less than or equal to f of 1. 
but an additional condition, which is f of 2 is less than f of 1. And that's not nice. That doesn't work so nice. This piece is not, it, it's not the sort of thing that, if we want to count these, it isn't going to work well. So, so that, that's no good. And, and later on, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about where this comes from. So there's a geometric way of looking at these things, which I find helpful. It's uh, maybe a little easier to be rigorous if you don't look at things this way. But I, I find it helpful to look at things this way. So we're thinking of this function from 1, 2, up to n to the real numbers as a point in Rn, the point f of 1, f of 2, f of n. And these inequalities correspond to cutting up Rn into by, by hyperplanes. So if you have an inequality of the form f of i less than or equal to f of j, that corresponds to looking at a half space. So you take a hyperplane, say the hyperplane f of i equals f of j. It's a hyperplane through the origin. And when you take the set of solutions of that inequality, you're looking at a half space. And if it's a weak inequality, then you're including the boundary hyperplane in that half space. And if it's a strict hyperplane, uh, uh, sorry, a strict inequality, then you're not including the boundary. So what we're doing is we're taking Rn and we're cutting it up into pieces by these hyperplanes through the origin, a very particular kind of hyperplane. And for each hyperplane, that hyperplane is going to go with one or the other of the two half spaces. And if we have a set of inequalities of this form, the set of solutions corresponds to taking the intersection of a bunch of these half spaces, some with the boundary and some without the boundary. So one of the things that we want to do is to make things work out nicely, we want to make sure that each hyperplane is attached to one of its two uh, corresponding half spaces in a way that's compatible. So we don't run into things like that example, which where things didn't work out nicely, that we had this sort of extra condition that didn't, didn't work very well. So let's look at the case n equals 3. So we're looking at functions. Um, we're looking at, at r3. But it turns out that we can project r3 into r2, project, project it perpendicular to the line x equals y equals z. And, and all of these inequalities are, are compatible with that. So I, I actually draw this picture in the plane. If I had to draw it in three, three dimensions, it would be a little harder to draw. So here, uh, those, these three lines through the origin correspond to f of 1 equals f of 3. Or if you like, you could think of it as x equals z, and y equals z, and, and um, x equals y. And for each of these planes, um, it's associated to one of the, of the half spaces. And the, the one that's colored is the one that has the, the, the plane on it. So that means that this, well, because it's projected, they're, they're actually lines. So this line is attached to this half space and not that half space. So um, you see that this cuts up the whole plane or, or the whole space into six pieces. And this one here, oops. This one has both of its boundary lines. These two and these two have just one of the boundary lines, the one that's pointing towards there. And this one has none of its boundary lines. And the way that this is um, set up is that I pick this one region here. And to make things work nicely, um, I have all of the, the, the boundary lines are attached to the half space that contains this region. So if you look at this, this line, this base region is on that side of it. And so I, take this, I attach this line to this side of the, uh, of the uh, I, I attach this line to this half space. OK, so, so the point is that I have this, uh, my plane cut up into these six pieces in a, in a nice way. Uh, so what's the rule for when we have a weak inequality and when a strict inequality? Well, as I said, one way to look at it is I just make sure that the weak inequality is so that this particular region is included in um, uh, the, the boundary line is on the half space that contains that region. But it turns out that it's pretty easy to see that that there's a very easy way to write it down more explicitly, which is you say, if i is less than j, 
then the corresponding inequalities or f of i is less than or equal to f of j. So that's where the weak inequality goes. It corresponds to um, f of i less than or equal to f of j, where i is less than j. And so the, the sets of inequalities that you want are things, you, you take inequalities of the form f of i is less than or equal to f of j, or f of i is greater than f of j, where i is less than j. So if you did things in a different way, they might not work out so well. I mean, you can do things that are equivalent, but, but this makes things work out very nicely. So one of the nice things about these inequalities is you can, was there a question or was that just, uh, just echo, I think. Okay, so um, you can represent a compatible set of inequalities by a poset. What, by compatible, I mean that, well, I mean a set of inequalities is going to be incompatible if, if there's no solution. So if I take something like f of 2 less than or equal to f of 3, f of 3 um, less than f of 1, and f of 1 less than or equal to f of 2, the set of solutions is empty. So that's what I mean by incompatible, and it co sort of corresponds to a cycle. So if I have a compatible set of inequalities, then I can represent them by a poset. So if I have f of 2 less than f of 1 and f of 2 less than or equal to f of 3, I can represent them by this, this poset. And the um, strict and weak inequalities are determined by, according to this rule, because 2 is less than or equal to 3, this will be f of 2 is less than or equal to 3. But because here 1 is less than 2, we would have an inequality f of 1 less than or equal to f of 2, or in this case, f of 2 is less than f of 1. So we have a weak inequality here and a strict inequality there. And so this brings up the, the sort of the official rule for defining p-partitions. And sometimes they, they just, this is usually saying, okay, here's the definition. And I've tried to sort of give you a little bit of motivation for defining that number, for why that condition 2 is there. So uh, if you have a partial order on 1 up to n, a totally arbitrary partial order, a p-partition is a function from 1, 2 up to n to the real numbers, satisfying that if i is less than j and p, so that less than sub p means in the partial order p, then f of i is less than or equal to f of j, and that's the ordering in the usual real numbers. And then, so that's saying that you have an order-preserving map. Uh, and then 2 is this sort of funnier condition if i is less than j in the partial order, but i is greater than j in the usual order on the integers, then we have a strict inequality there. So the reason for putting that in is that it makes things, uh, makes this decomposition fit together in a, in, a, in a nice way. So we'll let script p of p be the set of p partitions, and I'll let script l of p be the set of extensions of p to a linear order, and the set of extensions of p to a total order, and I'll, I'll draw a picture of what that means, but uh, it's what you would probably expect. And we have what I call the fundamental theorem of p partitions that says that the set of p partitions decomposes as a disjoint union of the p partitions that correspond to these total orders. So here's an example. Again, this, the same example. Here's a poset p that corresponds to this set of inequalities. And these are the two extensions of p to a total order. So they're, they're total orders that, where if something is less than something else here, then that's true over here. And if you look at the set of p partitions that corresponds to this total order, that's f of 2 less than f of 1 less than or equal to f of 3. So we get a strict inequality here because 2 is greater than 1 in the usual order, and f of 1 is less than or equal to f of 3 because 1 is less than 3 in the usual order. So we have a disjoint union of these two things. And um, let me just also mention that it's convenient to represent these total orders. So a total ordering of 1 up to n is really the same as a permutation. So a, a sort of, I'm going to want to rotate them, rotate them by uh, 90 degrees so I get this total order with a 2, 1, 3, I can think of as the permutation 2, 1, 3. So I'll often think of the, the linear extensions of, of a poset as just permutations. 
Okay, so here's a sketch of the proof. I mean, it's, if you want to give a more formal, rigorous proof, it's probably easier just to do it by induction, which is not too hard. But I, I want to try to just say essentially what I said before, which is that we, we take Rn and we cut it up into these pieces the way I did it in, in that example. For each i less than j, you take the hyperplane f of i equals f of j, and you um, take one or the other of the half spaces that correspond to it with the weak or strict inequalities as appropriate. So you take the intersection. So for every i less than j, you pick one or the other of the half spaces. You take the intersection of all of the space, half spaces that you've chosen. Some of these intersections will be empty. But n factorial of them will be non-empty, and these will each correspond to permutations. So they correspond to um, total orders. If you like, you could say that we have these two to the n choose two tournaments, and n factorial of them are transitive tournaments. And those are the ones that correspond to the non-empty intersections. And these give you these chambers that correspond to permutations. And each of them will have an appropriate part of the boundary. And so Rn will be the disjoint union of these things. And if you just look at the, par the um, part that corresponds to the linear uh, extensions, the, the, so you, you get these, these chambers, each of which corresponds to some permutation. If you just take the part that corresponds to the linear extensions of the post set, then this will correspond to the parts that correspond um, uh, give the uh, actually this should have been this should have been strict p. So if I look at the the part of R n that corresponds to the p partitions, then this is going to be a disjoint union of some of these pieces, and they're going to be the ones that correspond to the linear extensions of p. So this is not a I mean this is a little bit vague, but but I think it, hopefully it, it gives you a little bit more of a uh, an idea of geometrically why this works rather than a more rigorous but sort of less enlightening induction proof. OK, so what I want to actually do is count these p partitions in some way. And there are a number of different things that you can do with them. But what I'm going to do is just I'm going to count the p partitions in which the entries, also called the parts, lie in the set 1, 2, up to m. And the number of these is a polynomial in M, which is called the order polynomial. So I have this post set P, and this uh, omega sub P of M is the number of P partitions in which the parts are in the set 1, 2, up to M. So as an example, if P is a disjoint union of points, meaning there are no relations at all, then there are no restrictions at all on what a P partition is. And it's just an arbitrary function from 1, 2, up to N to the set 1, 2, up to m, and the number of those is m to the n. You can see that that is a polynomial in m of degree n. It'll always be a polynomial in m of degree n. So my post set p is always going to have n, um, n elements. So if throughout this whole talk, n is fixed. It's the number of elements of the post set p, and p is going to be a post set on the set 1, 2, up to n. OK, so another useful fact is that if you have a post set that's a disjoint union of two post sets, then say p1 and p2, then the order polynomial of p will be the product of the order polynomials. So that's just because if you've got some inequalities that involve here 2, 3, and 5, and some inequalities that involve 1, 4, and 6, those are completely independent. So to find the total number of solutions of these inequalities, you take the number of solutions over here that involve f of 2, f of 3, f of 5, and the solutions over here, and you just multiply them. OK. So another uh, simple observation is that if you take a total order that corresponds to the permutation 1, 2, up to n, that is, the, the post set looks like 1, 2, 3, up to n, then the order polynomial is m plus n minus 1 choose n. Well, here all of the inequalities are weak. So this is just the number of solutions of f of 1 less than or equal to f of 2, and so on up to f of n. And, and we, we pretty much know that that's just a basic fact, which uh, in fact, we've already seen that today in um, somebody's talk. OK. <laughs> in Bruce's talk, we, we saw that. Yeah, in fact, even the, we saw the Q analog there. OK. 
So what if you have an arbitrary permutation? Well, so here I'm going to talk about descents of permutation. A descent of a permutation uh, pi of n is an i for which pi of i is greater than pi of i plus 1. In other words, if you look at the one line notation, it's going to be just a place where one number is greater than the next number. And I'll let this of pi be the number of descents. So for an arbitrary permutation, the order polynomial is, is something very similar to what we had before. It's just shifted by oops, um, subtracting the number of descents there. So here, here's an example that shows why this is true. This is sort of one of the standard tricks of enumerative combinatorics. We want to, here's an example of a permutation 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, and those dots represent the descents. So the p partitions will satisfy this set of inequalities here. So some of them are weak and some of them are strict. What I'd like to do is convert them all into weak inequalities. And so we use this standard trick of saying that f of 4 less than f of 2 is the same as f of 4 less than or equal to f of 2 minus 1 because all of these things have to take on integer values. And so we, we do that with each of the strict inequalities. And in this case, there are two of them that correspond to the two descents, 4, 2, and 5, 3. And that corresponds to subtracting 2 from m at the end. And then, so the number of solutions here is just the same as what we had up there, but with n replaced by m minus 2. And of course, in this case, n is 5. But the same argument works in general. And we get, um, there's the, the general formula. OK, so this is something we definitely want to know. And something, uh, a formula which is actually a little bit nicer is the generating function for the order polynomial. Just by the binomial theorem, the generating function for this, this thing, you multiply by t to the m and sum on m, and you get um, you get this. So that plus 1 there is a bit of a nuisance, and I probably, I could have gotten rid of it by replacing m with m plus 1 everywhere. But this is the, this is the definition that Stanley gave for the order polynomial. And um, it makes some things a little bit nicer, makes some other things not so nice, but that's the way I'm doing it. So it gives us the number of descents plus 1, which is OK. OK. So, um, to prove this, uh, we just use the, the fundamental theorem of p partitions, which says that omega sub p of m is the sum of the uh, order polynomials for the linear extensions of p. For each of those, we have this, this formula here. So we just add that up over all of the linear extensions. So let's look at some applications. So, so maybe I should say that the sort of the point of this from my point of view, that originally, perhaps I should have mentioned that the theory of p partitions was really first uh, studied by McMahon many years ago, it, not in full generality. He didn't have the concept of a poset, as far as I know. But he looked at some special cases that were related to plane partitions, and he had the basic idea, stated in a little differently, but he had the basic idea. So his interest was actually counting, p parti uh, counting plane partitions by reducing them to a sort of a finite problem. But what I'm interested in is going the other way. I want to count, uh, count permutations by reducing them to computing order polynomials. So, so let's take the case in which p is an anti-chain. So there are no relations at all. We already saw that the order polynomial is m to the n. And the set of linear extensions of p is the set of all permutations of 1, 2, up to n. So plugging this into our formula, it says that that generating function on the left is equal to a sub n of t over 1 minus t to the n plus 1, where a sub n of t is the Eulerian polynomial that counts all permutations by, well, by 1 plus the number of descents. So that's sort of the standard definition of the Eulerian polynomial. Sometimes people divide it by t. <coughs> um, and here's another nice example, which is you take a disjoint union of two chains as your poset. So 
this corresponds to two permutations, sigma and tau. Well, they're not permutations of 1 up to n, but they're permutations of disjoint subsets. So sigma here is 6, 4, 1, 7, and tau is 5, 2, 3. And the set of linear extensions of this post set is going to be the set of all shuffles of sigma and tau. So what I mean by that is you take sigma 6, 4, 1, 7, and you write it out here. Uh, and you write out 5, 2, 3 in some, on the second line in some way such that they're, they're sort of spread out. And then you merge them together. So that's, that's a shuffle of, of 6, 4, 1, 7 and 5, 2, 3. And the theory of p-partitions then will allow us to count these by the number of descents. So the question is, if you've got two permutations, we, we'd like to say how many shuffles of them are there with a given number of descents. And just using the formulas that we already have, we get the generating function for these shuffles according to the number of descents as uh, we can... Oops. Um, the generating function is given by this, this infinite series. So it's a generating function for some polynomial. But um, so one observation is that this depends only on n1, n2, the number of descents of s of sigma and the number of descents of tau. In other words, when you're shuffling two permutations and you look at the descents of what you get, the result only depends on the number of descents of the two permutations that you were shuffling. In this case, we're sort of lucky that there's a simpler formula <coughs> that this can be evaluated explicitly, and we get a result which is sometimes called Stanley's, shuffle, Stanley's shuffling theorem. Actually, he proved something more general. He proved the Q-analog of this. And in fact, the whole theory of p-partitions, there's a parameter Q which corresponds to looking at the sum of all of the parts and combinatorially in terms of permutations, it corresponds to the major index. But just to keep things simple, I'm only looking at the q equals 1 case. But Stanley proved the more general result. And it says that the number of shuffles of sigma and tau, if sigma has a descents and tau has b descents, and sigma has length n1, tau has length n2, then the number of permutations, their shuffles of the two of them with k descents is given by this product of two binomial coefficients. It's not that easy to prove directly though there have been combinatorial or bijective proofs were found by Ian Gould and, and then later by Jonathan Stadler. But the proofs are not that easy. Um, another thing that's sometimes useful is to allow repeated labels in the post set. Uh, and to be rigorous, I should give some kind of definition. Um, but the idea is pretty straightforward. So as long as you don't use the same label on, on incomparable elements of the post set, then there's no problem. So here, for example, here's a post set which I've labeled with uh, ones and twos and threes. So it's a disjoint union of three chains. And I've labeled all the, the first <coughs> chain with all ones. So, but if you take any linear extension of this, it's pretty clear which one, for example, goes with which point, because the first one has to be that first lowest point there, and the second one has to be that, and so on. So we can identify the linear extensions of this post set with the multiset, um, with permutations of the multiset that has four ones, three twos, and four threes. And we can count the uh, permutations then of a multiset according to the number of descents. This is what's traditionally called Simon Newcomb's problem. And the answer that you get is what you get just by taking these, the order polynomials for these things, which are binomial coefficients, multiplying them taking their generating function. So there's no simpler formula than that. Here's one of my favorite examples. Let's look at this post set. And I've just to make things work out nicer, I've labeled it in, in the way it's labeled there with two ones and two twos and two threes and so on. So first of all, what is what are the linear extensions of this post set? Well, the linear extensions are certain permutations of the multiset with two copies each of 1, 2, up to n. And the condition, so notice that there's sort of, on the first 1 and 2 and 3, there's no relations among them. But the second occurrence of 1, 2, and so on have to occur in increasing order. So here's an example. 
of such a linear extension where I put the second entries in red and you see they're in increasing order. Uh, and it's not too hard to see that the number of such linear extensions is 1 times 3 times 5, and so on up to 2n minus 1. Well, what's the order polynomial for this poset? So the order polynomial I claim is the sum over all i1 less than or equal to i2 up to in. They have to be between 1 and m of i1 times i2 and so on. So why is that? Well, that's because if I have a p partition for this poset, I look at the value that's on each of these points. Those have to be in uh, weekly increasing order. So that gives me the i1 less than or equal to i2 and so on. They have to be between 1 and m. And then what are the values that can correspond to these other points? Well, this point has, can be anything from 1 to i1. This can be anything from 1 to i2 and so on. And so if I fix the values on these upper points, the number of possibilities for the lower points is i1 times i2 times i3 and so on. So we have this formula. And very conveniently, I mean, if this was all there was, it wouldn't be that interesting. But it turns out that this sum <coughs> happens to be equal to a Stirling number of the second kind. And so the order polynomial here is a Stirling number of the second kind. It, it's sort of well known that s of n plus m, m is a polynomial in m of degree 2n. It's a, sort of a well-known fact. And this says that the generating function for these is, uh, oops, I still keep hitting the wrong button. The generating function for these, um, this thing is this, this numerator gives, counts these permutations by these things. And I'll just mention that this is related to another combinatorial interpretation for these same polynomials in terms of descents of a slightly different set of polynomials that was studied, discovered by Richard Stanley, actually. And, and we wrote a joint paper on these other um, permutations. It's actually not too hard to show to get that result from this approach, but I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to do that. OK, so now I want to talk about a variation of the theory of p-partitions that corresponds to signed permutations. Um, perhaps I should mention that, that this is, for those of you who are familiar with root systems, that to some extent, this what I'm talking about can be generalized to any root system. And I think if you know about root systems, you'll sort of see, OK, I'm looking at these hyperplanes, and they correspond to uh, what I talked about before was the root systems of type A. And this is root systems of type B. But I'm not really going to talk much about root systems in, in, in this talk. But, but they're there. Uh, so here's another way of cutting up um, R2 into nice pieces. Instead of just, um, if I were looking at P partitions, I would just look at the line x equals y. It's, but now I'm going to put in some more lines. So I'm going to cut up R2 into. Um, eight pieces. So this is what's called, corresponds to what's called the root system of type B2. And that's all I'm going to say about root systems. So we, we, we do things in exactly the same way. We pick one of these regions, and I'll call it the base region, or base chamber. And um, all of these lines are going to correspond to, for each line I take, the two corresponding half spaces. And I attach the line to the half space that includes that yellow region. So. I'm, again, I have my two coordinates, f of 1, which you can think of as the x-coordinate, and f of 2 is the y-coordinate. And in each of these eight regions, I've written down the, uh, the inequalities with the weak and strong inequalities that correspond to that region, so that these inequalities divide up the whole plane into eight regions. Uh, every point is in exactly one of them. So we can study these inequalities. In fact, to some extent, you can do what I'm saying for any arrangement of hyperplanes at all. You take any arrangement of hyperplanes, and you, um, they give you a way of cutting up. Pick one of the regions and call it the base region, and uh, direct all of the, the half spaces, put the hyperplanes on the half space that's going towards that region. And some of this you can do. But to make things nice, you want to be able to count the points, in some sense, in each region, and you want them to be kind of similar. So, 
so here we, we everything is very nice. And oops, let's keep going the wrong way. So it's easy also to describe exactly when we have a strict and weak inequality if we set things up this way. So we have the same inequalities that we had before, but we also have some inequalities. f of i is greater than or equal to 0, and f of i is less than 0. So those correspond to the, to, uh, this, the horizontal and vertical lines. And we also have this inequality f of i plus f of j greater than or equal to 0 or less than 0. And that corresponds, in this case, to, to this line. So we can break things up as before. And um, each chamber then will correspond to what's called a signed permutation. So what's a signed permutation? Well, a signed permutation of 1, 2 up to n is a permutation of 1, 2 up to n in which some of the entries can be replaced by their negatives. So this is the one-line notation. You can look at them in several different ways. So this is the one-line notation for a signed permutation. And just because those minus signs are a little, the spacing doesn't look quite right, it's convenient to replace minus i with an i with a bar on top. So if I write it as 4 bar, 1 bar, 2, 5 bar, 3, it looks a lot nicer. So another way to think of a sign permutation, which where you see that they do form a group, is I, I can think of a sign permutation of n as a permutation of the set minus n up to n. It's con the zero doesn't really do anything, but it's convenient to have the zero there anyway, with the property that pi of minus i equals minus pi of i. So if I know what pi of i is for 1 up to n, that determines everything, but it's still uh, convenient to have these other things sometimes. So if I wrote that permutation out in full two-line notation, I would have this thing. So it's, it's determined by the, the right half. The, that's the, the one-line notation. Okay. And we define descents of signed permutations in the same way as for ordinary permutations. But I'm only looking at, the, so the descents of pi are the places where pi of i is greater than pi of i plus 1, but only for i from 0 up to n minus 1. So I don't, I don't look at the negative values of i. But I do look at i equals 0. So the thing that makes this particularly different from <clears throat> the case that we looked at before is we're going to say that we have a descent at position 0 if pi of 0 is greater than pi of 1. Pi of 0 is always 0. So this says that if your, your permutation starts with something negative, then it has a descent in the, at the beginning, in position 0. So that's the only. And now the descents of the permutations, it, again, it's not too hard to show this. Uh, I'm, I'm, but I'm going to not go through the details, that the descents of the permutations tell you where you have strict and weak inequalities in each of these chambers. So here, for example, this, let's say this corresponds to the permutation minus 2, 1. So it corresponds to the um, inequalities minus f of 2 is less than or equal to f of 1. Actually, perhaps I should have said f of minus 2, but I'll explain that a little bit later. And because this is negative, it starts with something negative. We have a strict inequality there. Here, because minus 2 is less than or equal to 1, we have a uh, minus 2 is less than 1, we have a weak inequality here. So everything breaks up very nicely. And um, what I'd like to do is I want to represent these more general inequalities by something that looks something like a poset. And I should say that this was first studied, or this was studied by my former student, Chao and Chow in his thesis a number of years ago. So I'll say that a signed poset uh, of order n is a partial order on the set minus n up to n that has a kind of symmetry property, that i is less than j in this poset if and only if minus j is less than minus i. So in a certain sense, the, the information here is kind of redundant because everything appears twice. But it's still useful to have this. So it's this poset with this symmetry. And 0 is, you know, 0 is sort of in the middle there, but it's convenient to have the 0 too. So I, I now, I, so I know what these signed posets are. And perhaps I should also mention that Vic Reiner considered something <coughs> similar to this, but not quite as, um, in my opinion, not as easy to work with. Though. So, um, so a p-partition for a signed poset is a function from plus or minus n, the minus n up to n, 
that has the property that f of minus i is equal to minus f of i. So this symmetry works through the, the p partitions also. And this implies that f of 0 equals 0. So then we have the same properties of, uh, as before for p partitions satisfying the inequalities that correspond to the poset. So if I take this poset, then a p partition is a function from minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2 that satisfies um, what has the, the symmetry uh, condition. And 0 is less than f of minus 2, and f of minus 1 is less than f of minus 2. I mean, I could write down two more inequalities, but they're, they're redundant. And I also can talk about linear extensions of these posets. Well, I don't want arbitrary linear extensions. I want the linear extensions that are also signed posets. So they have to have this symmetry property. And in this case, it's easy to see that there are three uh, of these symmetric linear extensions. So there are minus 2 it has to be above 0, um, but the minus 1 could go in, in any of three places. And when you're looking at the linear extensions, you know, everything, you'll have some stuff above zero and then some stuff below zero. The whole thing is really determined by what's above zero. So I could just look, if I just look at the part that's above zero I, and rotate it 90 degrees, I get the one line notation for a signed poset. So we have this decomposition, the fundamental theorem of p partitions that works exactly the same for signed partitions, signed p partitions. And uh, we, can, we can identify the linear extensions with signed permutations. We can define the order polynomial. It turns out that the, the way to define the order polynomial that makes things work, not surprisingly, is you count p partitions in which the values are in the set from minus m to m. And we have something just like the fundamental theorem, uh, the same theorem that we had before. One minor difference is you, you don't add you don't have the number of descents plus 1. You just have the number of descents there. And that's, uh, well, that's, that's the way it is. Um, so if you take, for example, p to be an antichain, so there are no relations at all, then L of p is the set of all signed permutations, which I'm denoting by b, of b sub n. And the order polynomial will be 2n plus 1 to the n, because for a p partition, there are m, two m plus one different values that it can, can take on, anything from minus m up to m. And so we get two m plus one to the n as the order polynomial. And the generating function gives us this numerator polynomial that counts sine permutations by descents. I think this formula was first found by Einar Steingrims, and at least first published by him. Here's another example. Suppose that we want to count permutations, uh, going back to ordinary permutations that start with something in particular. So for example, I want to count permutations of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that start with a 3. So if I do that, that means that if you look at what comes after the 3, if it's something less than 3, you'll get a descent there. And if you look at something that's bigger than 3, you won't get a descent there. Well, you can use the ordinary theory of p partitions to do this, but it turns out that you get something that works out a little bit more simply or more directly if you use signed um, p partitions and signed permutations, even though this is stated with just ordinary permutations. So what you want to do is sort of replace the 3 that comes at the beginning with 0. And then so here 1 and 2 are less than 3. We, we re replace them with some negative numbers and leave the 4 and 5 as positive numbers. So we can, uh, an equivalent problem is to count permutations of this set, minus 4, minus 3, 0, 1, 2, that start with a 0. And this is just counting linear extensions of a certain sign poset that looks like this. So in, in a way, it's sort of overkill to use this theory, but it still works out very nicely. And so here the order, the sign order polynomial it's not hard to see that that's m squared times m plus 1 squared. That's for the 1 and the 2, f of 1 and f of 2 are something between 0 and m. Because they're, because they're positive, we have a weak inequality there. 
But f of minus 3 and f of minus 4 have to be between 1 and m, because those are um, less than 0, and so those give us strict inequalities. So we get this order polynomial on the left, and on the right, that gives us the, uh, the answer to the problem. It's the generating function. And by the same reasoning, you can count permutations of 1, 2, up to n that with the given number of descents that start with any given thing. And you get this, this formula, which is, it gives a kind of a, a generalization of the Eulerian polynomials. It reduces <coughs> to them for j equals 1 and j equals n. Uh, I want to talk for my last topic about um, a, sort of a variation for sign permutations that gives something called the flag descent number. So this was the, invented in 2001 by Adin, Frenthi, and Reichmann, uh, a variation of the number of descents. And the definition seems kind of strange, that you, the flag descent number is twice the number of descents if the permutation starts with something positive, but it's twice the number of descents minus 1 if it starts with something negative. Or another way to look at it is that a descent at the beginning of a sign permutation contributes 1 to the flag descent number, but a descent anywhere else contributes 2. So if you think of the information that it gives you, if the flag descent number is odd, then it starts with a descent, starts with something negative, and if the flag descent number is even, it starts with something positive. So it sort of has the same information as the number of descents, plus whether it starts with something even or odd. And um, Adin, Branty, and Reuchman proved this sort of surprising or somewhat interesting formula, certainly, that if you look at this generating function, then and put it over this sort of funny-looking denominator, then the numerator polynomial counts sign permutations by flag descents. And incidentally, because we know that this, you know, if you just change uh, n to n minus 1, you get the Eulerian polynomial. So we have to take out that factor t. It says that this enumerator of sign permutations by flag descents is a power of t times the Eulerian polynomial, which is a sort of uh, an interesting formula. More recently, uh, th this has been proved um, bijectively by, uh, I don't remember who, someone recently. Um, so, to sort of motive, so what, the way that we can prove this is using a variation of the order polynomial for sine cosets. And to motivate it, uh, let me just restate what the order polynomial is. So it's the number of p partitions with parts in this, the set minus m up to m. I'm going to divide everything by m, and so then I'll get a p partition with parts in the interval from minus 1 to 1 that are not necessarily integers, but they're, they're, the uh, entries are 1 over m times integers. So another way to put it is that this is the number of points in an, a certain region of this cube, unit cube, uh, well, that cube, with coordinates in 1 over m times the integers. So for those of you who are familiar with Earhart polynomials, this is it's essentially an Earhart polynomial with the uh, difference that we don't necessarily, we, we might have just part of the boundary. So I'll define what I call the flag order quasi-polynomial by shifting this interval minus 1, 1 to 0, 1. So it's a quasi-polynomial because it's not really, it's not a polynomial anymore, but it's, it's almost a polynomial. And because I'm starting to run out of time, I, I won't be elaborate on that point. So going back to the picture that we had before, for an ordinary polynomial, we, we were taking, if n equals 2, we had this picture. And now I'm looking at this square with, uh, bounded by um, the four points with coordinates plus or minus 1. So I, I look at points in some, so I, I take this square and I cut it up into these regions. And I, I take some of the regions. And I'm counting the points there uh, with coordinates in 1 over m times z. I take the same picture. And then I just shift it so that it's now in this square, the unit square. And you can sort of see that, uh, so I'm looking at, at points with coordinates in 1 over mz here. You can sort of see that, well, if m is even, then this is really going to be the same as what I had you know, uh, for m over 2 in that other picture. But if m is odd, it's going to be a little bit different just because that, that point in the middle 
is no longer going to be a lattice point if m is odd. So, so this is what we're going to we're, we're going to count. So we're, again, we're, we're counting essentially the same kind of uh, looking at an Earhart polynomial, but of, of almost the same region, but just shifted a little, uh, shifted and translated. So what does that give us? Well, one observation is that the flag order quasi polynomial for an antechain of endpoints is m plus one to the n, and that's because if you going back to here, if we're looking at an antichain, that means that we're looking at the whole square. So we're just looking at points in this unit square with coordinates uh, in 1 over m times z. And so every coordinate goes from 0 up to m. So that, that's an actual ordinary Earhart polynomial, m plus 1 to the n. And what we want to do now is we have the same de kind of decomposition that we had before that works exactly the same way. We have to find the flag order quasi polynomial for a total order, that is, for a signed permutation. And this is the basic result that we get there. For a signed permutation, it's sort of what you would expect looking at what we're hoping to get. The generating function for this flag quasi order, flag order quasi polynomial, it's t to the flag descent number of the permutation divided by this same denominator that we had there. So let me just give an example as to, that, that shows you why this works. So if you take the definition that I gave for the flag order quasi polynomial, it's not too hard to transform it, you know, multiplying back again by m, that what we're looking at is we're looking at p partitions with values from minus m to m that have this additional property that all of the values of the p partition have to have the same parity as m. So they have the same parity as m. So you can see if m is even, if you divide everything by 2, then you're getting just ordinary um, p partitions, but in m is odd, things are going to be a little bit different. So let's just look at one example. So I'll take this particular permutation, uh, minus 1, minus 3, 4, 2. So it has flag descent number 5, because it's got a descent at the beginning and two more descents. And the things that we want to count are five tuples. So here I'm going to count, rather than fixing m, I'm going to get the generating function over all m. So I'm going to count these things for the values of f and m, and multiply this by t to the m, get the generating function. So all the entries have to have the same parity. f of minus 1 and so on up to m have to have the same parity. So first, let's look at the, there's a, a minimal such 5 tuple. If you make everything as small as possible, well, f of minus 1 has to be greater than 0. So the smallest it could be is 1. And if it's 1, then everything else has to be odd. So anytime you have to go up, you have to go up by at least 2. So f of minus 3 has to be at least 3. f of 4 doesn't have to be any larger. f of 2 has to go up, so it has to be at least 5, and so on. And that 5 is the flag descent number. And it's not too hard to see that it's always going to work that way. But at the beginning, the smallest value, the f of the first value, is the smallest possibility is either 0 or 1. But after that, whenever you go up, you go up by 2, and you go up by 2 whenever there's a descent. And it's not hard to see that you get all such 5 tuples by, well, you can increase everything by 1. And if you do that, you preserve the parity. But if you don't, you, you can increase uh, this thing by, say, starting anywhere, like maybe with f of 4, and increasing everything from 4, 1, whoops, by the same amount. But if you're not increasing everything, then you have to increase things by a multiple of 2. So another way to say that is you get all such multiples by adding any multiples of these vectors uh, to your, your 5 tuple. And so the first one contributes 1 to m. And that's why we have the 1 minus t in the denominator. And the others contribute <coughs> add increase m by 2. And that's why they all contribute 1 minus t squared. So um, adding these up over all of the uh, linear extensions, we get this analog for flag descent numbers of the uh, basic fact about um, counting permutations by descents with their um, order polynomials. So the special case where the, the poset is a disjoint union of chains is, is the uh, result of Ideen, Brenty, and Reichman. And I'll just mention that you also have an analog of Stanley's shuffle root theorem by the same uh, reasoning, although it's maybe not all that exciting. And if I had more time, I was going to 
tell you about colored permutations, but when I was preparing this talk, I realized I'm not going to have time to do that, so I'm sorry for not talking about colored permutations. But, but there's a sort of another variation where you can count colored permutations by descents, also using a variation of p partitions. Thank you. Are there any questions?